Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Curating and Maintaining Vibrant Collections for Users with Print Disabilities. My name is Courtney Brown, and I'm the Southeast Regional Coordinator from the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. I'll be your host and question moderator today. Our presenter this morning is Holly Haybear. Holly has worked in both public and academic libraries as a collection and as a collection development librarian for a library vendor. Currently an assistant professor in the Master of Library Science program at Middle Tennessee State University. She enjoys hiking, traveling, cooking, eating, genealogy, photography, knitting, and spending time with her family. You can find her on Twitter at Holly A. Bear, M-L-I-S. Just a couple of announcements. To register for other webinars or other trainings available from the Professional Development Office, please see the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at www.in.gov slash library. For a full list of our current in-person training menu, please see our continuing education website. This session is about an hour, so you'll receive one LEU for this presentation. If you're watching an archived recording of this webinar, instructions on how to obtain your LEU are in the video's description on YouTube, or you can also find those instructions on the ISL's continuing education site under LEU policies. So without further ado, I am gonna turn the presentation over to Holly. Thank you so much. Let me get where I can see what I'm doing. Okay. Um, Good morning, everyone. Happy St. Patrick's Day, right? Um, it's good to be with everyone today. And thank you so much for Courtney uh, inviting me. We met in Reno at ARSL in the fall. Um, so that was a great thing. So I appreciate the invitation. So I'm excited to talk to you this morning about large print collections and uh, overall collections for people with uh, print disability. So my, my study actually started out as a, a survey for large print collections, but I expanded from there when I realized that there was, there was more than just that. So it was a learning experience for me as well. And so I hope to share some of that with you today. Um, so Courtney's going to help me monitor the chat. And if there's anything uh, that I need to know, she'll just stop me and we'll go from there. But hopefully, uh, Hopefully internet will stay stable and everything else today. So um, let's get started. So, and I also want to thank everyone. If you uh, filled out a survey that came your way in fall of 2019, that was very long and way too long. Uh, thank you so much for filling it out. Um, 1500 people across the nation responded, which was a great response and, um, so just thank you so much for it. Um, it was kind of one of my first learning experiences with a national survey and it was, it was way too long, but many of you survived and, and made it through it. Um, so today we're gonna talk about print disability. What is it? We're gonna go over some formats, user preferences, strategies, uh, some considerations to keep in mind and then have a discussion at the end. Um, so let's get started. So first of all, what is a print disability? And I have to admit that this was a term that I didn't know before I started this a couple of years ago. So it was new to me as well. Um, I had some perceptions when I worked in the library that was not necessarily, let's just say I have a broader perspective now than I did then. Um, so, um, George Kirscher was the one who first coined this term print disability. And as you can see, he says that it is people who cannot effectively read print because of a visual or physical, perceptual, developmental, cognitive, or learning disability. Um, and the DAISY Consortium is a global consortium that deals primarily what well, started out dealing with audio. Um, and they are a big uh, consortium about accessibility and formats and all of that. So, and they have some trainings as well if you ever want to look into them. And I, uh, I also forwarded Courtney my um, references. So she has a PDF that she can send to you as well of the references from where I got some of my information. So, so when we think of 
those who have a print disability. This includes people who are blind, who have uh, the designation as, as having low vision enough to be blind, um, having low vision, dyslexia, ADHD, and anyone else who just has trouble using a print book for any reason. So you can see that this really opens it up to a lot of other people that you wouldn't think of um, for these kinds of issues. And that is estimated at being about five to 10% of the population. Um, in a book, uh, No Shelf Required, Sue Polanka said that between five and 10% of the population is affected. That was from a few years ago. The DAISY Consortium estimates up to 10%. So roughly one in 10 to one in 20 of your user population has a print disability of some sort. So that is not insignificant. That is a lot of people when you think about it. So large print and reading, Lately, large print is sort of making a, um, a comeback, so to speak, and they are people who study reading are looking at large print as well. Um, whereas I feel like it used to be, you know, the realm of older people. We, we, you know, my stereotypical patron would have been an older person who can't see well anymore, and so they need large print collection. And that was, that was kind of the box I put around it. But studies are being done more and more for large print and reading in general, for people, for children, as well as English language learners. Um, and so you're starting to see more books published in large print for other groups, other than just that token group that some people assume. So as you can see, um, from my slide that they're saying that large print reduces reading anxiety. It's it, uh, allows for better comprehension and it's useful for English language learners or any language learners really. Um, a national study done in 2019 by Project Tomorrow with school children found a 43% reduction of anxiety around reading. 60% said they could focus better and 75% of teachers with students reading below age level demonstrated better comprehension and retention when reading large print. So let's look at some of the formats and just go through a little history of some of this. I kind of geek out at some of this, so uh, bear with me. Um, but when we're looking at reading per se, we're looking at the formats basically of large print, eBooks, digital print, Braille um, services from the National Library through your local state library, and also technology that allows for large print reading, such as some of the magnification software that you have in your um, libraries to help people enlarge the screen and such. Um, according to ALA, all information sources that provide, um, sorry, you're in the, hold on. I gotta move the chat thing up. According to ALA, all information resources that are provided directly or indirectly to by the library, regardless of technology format or methods of delivery should be readily, equally and equitably accessible to all library users. Sometimes this is easier said than done. We all have budgetary, issues. It's not like there's money to buy everything. So part of the issue is balance and how do we um, consider the cost versus usage and things like that. And that's just always going to be a tension, I think, because obviously we were never going to just have a ton of money uh, coming towards libraries. Um, so uh, a little history. Um, so I had a I have a book, I confess, I found a book that was done in the 80s. Um, and it was a giant study done in Britain on large print users. And I sort of, that kind of started this whole ball rolling. Um, but um, so I started going back into the archives. I was interested in when did large print actually come about in libraries? And so you'll see that, you know, in the 1930s, um, Braille, became available nationally. That was one of the first things that happened as far as people with low vision. 
And then in the late 60s is when large print collections started to standardize. I think it was 1968 or so that New York City and Philadelphia started the first large print collections. So that, so roughly that is as old as I am. Um, so it's, it's not been around a super long time. And then of course, in 2008 or so is when eBooks, 2008 to 2011 um, is when eBooks started coming around and you had the Kindle and the Nook and the iPad and whatever, I can't remember which some of the earlier ones, Sony. Um, but if you are working in the library at that time, you remember when everybody and their grandmother got one of these devices for Christmas and they all brought them sometimes in the box like to you and said, hey, <laughs> what do I do with this? I mean, I remember this because we were like, really? Okay, so we had to like teach people how to use their device and then perform the 27 steps to get them to their ebook, right? Thankfully, it's gotten a lot easier than it used to be. Um, so basically the digital print in this format has been around for about 15 years, I'd say. So when you look at some of the benefits to users uh, of, and, and I don't like to, well, I do and I don't like to compare large print and, and eBooks, but um, I think they both are valid. Um, so large print obviously has large type. It has been standardized to 18 point font um, for a long time in several decades. It, uh, publishers kept going back and forth. They were trying to figure out kind of like the best size. And now it's basically standardized at 18 point font is what they pretty much landed on. Um, obviously large print books, they have, there's more spacing if you looked in them. There, it has easy to read font and it, it is a manual item that doesn't need electricity or Wi-Fi. And that is an important feature to remember that some people forget that a lot of our users in rural areas or for other reasons don't have uh, devices or they don't have Wi-Fi to download the item. So, you know, a book is just a book and it's always there to, you can just open it up, right? So that is definitely something I see very valuable about it. So in eBooks, and this has evolved as we've gone on, there's, you know, there's new, when paper white came out with the different background that it was easier on your eyes, that was kind of revolutionary. Um, so you see the text size can be changed. Um, there's a dyslexic font available in Kindle and other devices, so you can change the font so it can be easier to read with people with dyslexia. The lighting can be changed, colors can be changed for people who have um, issues with colors, the line spacing can be changed, and in some instances there's a text-to-speech capability and also multiple modalities. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. So um, let's switch here to audio. So um, when we're talking about books, we're also talking about people listening to books, right? Um, so that some of the different formats we have are the CD, PlayAway, e-audio, and uh, your state library has the BARD system, I believe. And Laura is with us today, um, so she can help talk about this at the end, because she knows much better than I do about your state library uh, system. Um, but as you know, the CD is in transition and, and, you know, the formats, they change, especially, you know, the book, that large print book that you, you know, it was made a hundred years ago or whatever, it's still there in the same format. It hasn't changed. Right. Um, but like the technology, whenever we get into that, as you know, it always changes. So CDs are in transition. I personally have a 2016 Honda, which has a CD player. So I still check out CD books on CD. Um, I have one by Louise Penny right now uh, for my car. Um, I know those are sort of in transition and going away and everybody's going on to the next thing. So one of the challenges is, you know, to sort of not get ahead of everybody. 
um, or not get behind everybody either. So I know that's just some decision that you're going to have to make as you go on. Um, but because buying a new car right now, it is super hard to find a CD. Most don't have a CD player. So for instance, I will have to get used to um, using my phone or some other way um, to listen to books in my car. Um, so a little history of audio in the 1930s. Um, LP records were common in libraries. Um, in the 60s, you had a track and then the cassette tape and the compact disc. disc and somewhere in there were um, the silver disc records. And I can't remember what those are called right now. But I remember um, I used to work in Michigan and there was a library, I can't remember where, um, that had a whole giant collection of these silver discs that I had never seen. I, I had never seen one before. And I was amazed that somebody had a whole collection of them. Um, but obviously now nobody would know what to do with them, right? So then you had playaways come about and you have um, all sorts of different playaways now. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but from the playaway company, um, you have different devices now that do all sorts of different things. And then you have uh, uh, digital audio. Um, and I did want to add that I had, uh, had spoken to several librarians at, at libraries. And um, when I originally did this, I had left Playaways out because I had forgotten about them. Because personally, I don't use them. But I know that a lot of people, uh, at least in the library I used to work at, they were, they were very popular for people who were runners or uh, walkers or things like that. Um, and a lot of librarians, they consider playaways to be sort of a bridge between CDs and digital. Um, so, and price wise, they seem to be comparable. Um, so that's one consideration of playaways if you haven't really gotten into them. So according to the DAISY Consortium, which like I said before, um, mostly uh, deals it started to deal with audio at first, but I think it deals with a lot of different things now. Um, they have some standards for audio. And one is for listening, a user should be able to listen to their content without input or interruption. A user should be able to download stream or offline, not steam, stream, or offline their content. Navigation, a user should be able to know when and where they are in their audio book. Um, that's, uh, in my mind, a little more difficult than with a um, ebook, um, especially to find your, you know, at least in the car. I, I'm not a super user, right? I'm still the CD in the car person. Um, you know, there's there's only stopping points so often uh, on the audio CD. Like I have to go back to the last chapter, the last bit. Um, and accessibility, regardless of ability, a user should be able to enjoy their content. So those are just some high standards that the DAISY Consortium is saying. So uh, I had mentioned um, dual modality, or it's also called immersion reading, which means listening and reading at the same time. And many of us are familiar with that. If you work in the children's area or you had children back when my children were small, um, we had the little, we took out the little bag with the book and the cassette tape, and that's how they did immersion reading. Um, more recently, I have found myself doing immersion reading with, with two authors because I, since the pandemic, I really just wanted to go to Paris. And um, of course, I'm still here and I haven't been to Paris yet, but someday. And so I discovered I, I'm a big mystery person, Kara Black. Um, uh, writes and she has a lot of um, French words in her books and so does Louise Penny and Louise Penny has you know with Inspector Gamache and all of those Armand Gamache I never could understand how to pronounce the characters in Louise Penny's books um, and so I never read them and I knew she was super popular but I just couldn't get past the fact that I would look at something and I didn't know how to pronounce it and that drove me nuts. Anyway, I discovered that you can do immersion reading and listen and read at the same time, which helped me get over that. So with Kara Black, I'm learning more French words. And with Louise Penny, I've learned how to pronounce 
all of the French sounding things in her book. And um, now I love her and she's one of my favorite authors. So um, just a, a plug for immersion reading here. Uh, and Kindle does have some format with that. If you get the uh, Kindle book and the Audible that matches, uh, you can match them up sometimes. It's a little tricky. I've had to borrow one from the library and then buy one, um, but uh, I think that's something that we should think about in the future of, of presenting to users more easily. Um, I came across this quote in, in some of my research, the sufficient and ready availability of formats in libraries should be seen as an issue of diversity and inclusion, irrespective of whether we focus on community members with disabilities or those who prefer non-textual formats for a variety of reasons and personal choices. I'll admit that um, when I last worked in the public library, I was, and I, I'm a little embarrassed to say this now, but I was pretty judgmental sometimes when parents would come up and they would only want the audio book. Um, I was pretty judgmental about that um, and thinking, well, the child should be reading the book. They should be reading, uh, you know, uh, visually. And, and this whole thing has really opened up to my eyes that, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to read. And as librarians, we definitely should not be judgmental and we should learn more of this. There's so many reasons that people would prefer um, different formats and we should not be the judge and jury of them. So um, from here, I wanna go into some of the large print study that I did and the survey that I did um, that some of you all helped me with. Um, I had a, uh, a friend, I have a friend still, her name is Kara and she works in a public library right now. And so we did two studies. We did the national survey that went to all librarians who collect for large print. And then we did an in-house study at this local library of large print users and they themselves gave us information. So what I'm gonna present to you now is a combination of what we got from our local users. Um, so your mileage may vary because those are our local users. Um, and then the national information that we got. And also I was interested in seeing that, you know, when, when eBooks first came out, people said, well, print books are gonna be dead. You know, they're just gonna go away. Who would want them anymore? And so part of my study was to see, well, where are we? Cause it's been, as you can see, almost 15 years now. Um, and obviously we still have books. So I think at least that part is, is um, not true that you know print was gonna be dead. Um, and I did have a bias towards that because I still over, overwhelmingly will choose print when I can. Um, but that's, this is where some of this came from. So in our study in the United States, um, we asked about their, their large print collection in the last five years. And the blue shows an increase and the gray shows a decrease. So, oh, on this slide, you can see that obviously in the last five years, overwhelmingly there has been an increase in collection size of large print. So if you are someone who was thinking that large print was being phased out, we found that that is not true at all. That is actually growing that circulation is growing, which obviously correlates to that. Um, and budgets are somewhat growing, uh, which is a good thing. Of course, that doesn't mean that you have a lot of money. It's just that as people are, are increasing their collection in their large print, they're probably putting a little bit more money towards that. Now, this is not, I wasn't asking about eBooks here, so I'm not, I can't give you numbers on versus you know, and I do have to say that this was done in 2019 before the world changed. So I don't know since the pandemic and we're still working through that. I don't think by and large that users have changed. Although I believe that maybe some people um, who were reading large print, maybe they finally learned how to use, um, you know, an ebook system because that's all that was available. I don't know. 
Um, and I also don't know if they still prefer that or they really want to get back to their large print collection books in your library. Um, so they'll be interesting to see what happens after this whole big upheaval. <laughs> and as you ex would expect, large print um, users uh, skew toward older um, by and large. And this was looking at just large print users and large print users in the adult section. So there's so many factors that go into this, um, what we collect in this large print uh, section, things like that. Um, and then you see it broken out between blue and red. So I, I asked them which format they preferred. So for the red is for those who prefer large print. Now that doesn't mean they don't use other formats as we'll see as we go on. Um, but the red is specifically um, large print. So that's why you see the red skewing older because older people do have more vision problems in general. I know that since I started this study in 2019, even my vision has gotten worse, which is super annoying, but it is true nonetheless. And I can see some of the, I'll talk about some of the things as we go ahead. Um, this was interesting, and this was from the users themselves. How many large print books do you read on an average month? And you'll see that the large people who prefer large print, by and large, read a lot more than those who um, uh, are non-large print preferred readers. Your large print users are readers. They go through the books, as you probably know. And if you have a very tiny large print collection, you know, they might get to the end of it and say, okay, so what's next here? And that's where we talk about maybe um, changing out some collections or some rotation or something. So um, then we asked those who, who don't prefer large print, why they use, or they don't need large print, sorry, um, for their vision, why they, some people use large print and not because of their vision. Um, and the answers were that there's less eye strain, they're, they're easier to read in low light, easier to read while exercising. I assume they're on the treadmill or something, or um, I don't know, I can't do that, but some a lot of people do, um, that you can read them more quickly. Um, this came up time and time again, it's faster than waiting for the standard print or ebook. So some people don't care about the format, they just want to get to the book. So whatever format is available, they will take. And that's a big um, point to that, um, you know, uh, users are just looking for a form, a book, you know, as they have a preferred format, but a lot of them are very flexible and that there are other users to your large print collection than just those who you would think are the typical users. Um, uh, and as well, when they use it when there's no other copies available. So when we looked at the format, preferred format of our local users, this is what they said to us, that 58%, and this was users of the large print, they 58% um, preferred the large print, 23% uh, preferred standard, and then it went down there from there. So you can see that audiobooks on CD were the least. Um, their e-audio was higher than audio on CD, and that might just be the changing of the time of people not using CDs as much. But there's quite a big drop off between, if you look at this, between reading it visually and uh, listening, as you can see from this. Um, and this goes back to our national study combined with our local users of if you are wanting a format, do you prefer, prefer print or digital? And you can see that in 2019, overwhelmingly 78% of people preferred print. Um, I believe the electronic is growing um, as we, you know, as people become more familiar with technology and it's more ready, readily available. And certainly with the pandemic, when libraries were closed and all you had to offer was eBooks. Um, but, but I still believe that 
you know, by and large, people prefer print. So that is my one caution of sometimes we jump on the new thing and, you know, if you're not familiar with users, you might say, hey, let's just all throw it all towards eBooks because nobody wants books anymore. But that is just not true at all. Um, now, your mileage may vary, your patrons may vary. You might have a, a community that really does prefer eBooks. Um, but this is what we found in our study anyway from 2019. So why do some readers not choose large print to look at the other side of this? Um, one, maybe they don't know about the large print collection. It's not like one that we promote the most for sure. It's not the sexiest collection out there, right? Um, so some people honestly just don't know that it, it exists. Maybe they've never seen it. Maybe they've just never come across it. They just don't know about it. Um, maybe there's a stigma about large print users. I think I've felt that because I assumed that large print users were a certain kind of person. And, um, and I didn't want to admit that I would need to use that. I don't need to use large print yet, but I, I, I feel that like I don't, want to say, oh, well, I guess I must be old enough. I can't see well enough. I have to use a large print. Nobody likes that. Nobody chooses that, right? Um, maybe they've read them all. Like we're, we talked about the large print users that um, they read a lot. They check out a lot of books. So if you have a very small collection, one of the issues that you run into is they've read them all. Now what? Um, so uh, you don't, uh, or you don't have books that they are interested in. Another um, stereotype is that, you know, they're all old females who like cozy mysteries and that's all you should have in your collection. Well, that's not true at all. Um, or they find that items are checked out that they want and they can't, if they truly need large print, then that's, that's one issue is if you really need the large print, but it's checked out, then your options are limited if you can't read standard print and you maybe don't have a device that you can use with eBooks. Or um, some users have trouble getting to the library. If they can't see well in the first place, they probably aren't driving or shouldn't be driving and they need help to get to the library um, or they need to have somebody pick up books for them, which was frequently what happened um, at the library I worked at. I'll so let's look at I have yes. a question for you. Someone yeah. asked if your, if your study included academic libraries. It did not. That, that is something we could do in the future, um, but it, it was solely with public so far, but that would be an interesting study. So. Um, so let's look at some of the reading preferences. I talked about you know not assuming that people all just want cozy mysteries. Um, this is from the local study. This is what people preferred. And it's probably not, if you work with these collections, you know, a lot of what I'm saying you already know, um, but it's always good to, to look at the, the data to see where you're at fall in nationally. So um, for nonfiction, you know, the bestsellers that are coming out, which are often uh, historical or political or uh, biographies or things like that, and as you see in our in our local survey, we accidentally left off biographies, but we had an other box and people wrote in biography, which is a, a it was a big error on our part. We knew we just missed that. So I would include biographies in there because they're obviously one of the biggest um, preferences for nonfiction. Also, travel, religious, and cookbooks. Now I know when we get into nonfiction, the trouble is finding these items that are built, you know, are published in large print. So that's still an issue as we'll see going forward. Um, for the fiction, it was, you know, there's no surprise here, but it's just that we shouldn't pigeonhole people. Um, there's bestsellers were number one, historical fiction, mysteries, thrill, thriller suspense, and then contemporary fiction were the top five. Um, I, we did um, publish these uh, studies so you can see the whole thing if, if you read the article, um, but we try to cut it off somewhat. 
Um, here's one that shows more from the national study. And this is what librarians thought, those who collect for large print collections, what they found was most popular. So you'll see that the top five are pretty much the same. And then Westerns are kind of making a comeback, right? Um, obviously, romance is in there, classics. Uh, and then you had some much smaller categories of young adults looking for this. And I think this is going to happen more and more as large print is found to be useful for other age groups. Um, plus, um, what came up in the study as well uh, is that some grandparents wanted to have large print so they could read to their children. Um, you've got adults who love to read YA books, like who of us, you know, we all read Harry Potter, right? Um, I read Lemony Snicket, I read all sorts of YA books are super popular amongst adults and um, youth. So why should we have a barrier there? All right, so national um, results for the nonfiction was as you expected. Um, you can read these. Uh, obviously, true crime came in, that's a big one. Um, but one thing I did find through this is that 10% of libraries surveyed didn't offer any nonfiction in large print. So I'm not sure if they didn't think about biographies being nonfiction or some just said they just don't offer it because nobody wants it, which I don't know. I, that could be true, or maybe it's like self-fulfilling prophecy. You don't offer it, so of course they don't check it out. So um, it's hard to say there. Um, so let's switch uh, on to vendors. We did ask about vendors. Where do you buy your large print? Um, these are probably no surprise to you. Uh, Gail sends it. The Galeson Gage Thorndike, which is all kind of one giant company, uh, came out on top. Then Centerpoint, Baker and Taylor, Amazon, a little surprising to me, but I know that people use Amazon just because of money issues. Um, Ingram, and then it goes down from there. Um, when you look at cost comparisons across formats, now this, I did this a couple of years ago, so this might not be true today. Um, but I was looking at the library book, which is super popular. Um, and you can see that the large print is more money by about $7, or it was at the time. And then the audio CD was a little more, and the play away was a little more. And the ebook um, was more, but ebook, you have different issues because you have, you know, the, the, the contracts and all that, and the usage and all that. Um, and for the ebook, I just had trouble, and I guess I never went back to um, look at this. Sorry about that. Um, I was not able to get a, a price for that, but you can certainly do that on your own. So you'll see the different uh, price, price points. And obviously, you know, some of these other formats do cost more. Um, and that is an issue because money is always an issue. But, um, you know, you can see that other people use large print, not just the people you think would use it. Um, so there is that. And then just one word on on change. We, I think I touched on this before. Um, at the top, you have the uh, play away. Um, I can't remember what that one is called, but you probably all know it, launch. Um, but they now have, at first, those are sort of for children, right? But when I looked last night, you know, they've updated that. There's a lot of um, uh, content for adults now on, on those devices. I know our local library right here in Spring Hill actually has a lot of these, and I probably should check one out to see, see what's on them. You also have the Wonder Books, which is uh, the, with the, the device kind of in there, um, and that just, you know, those children and reading and listening, it seems to have been something that's been around uh, forever, right? And uh, when I was a kid, I had a book, a little book with a little 45 LP in it. So that's how, how old I am. But that's how our, our audio and book came together. Um, and then you'll see uh, Play Away, obviously, Brene Brown's latest book there. So the, the challenge is, is, do you get ahead? Do you buy a, a bunch of the <clears throat> new technology? Um, you, you can't get too ahead of your users, um, 
but at the same time, you can't get behind them either. So it's sort of a balancing act. And then you have the money situation, which we all know. So um, I asked them what some of the reasons are, and I know I gotta hurry up here because I'm almost out of time. Um, reasons for not having a lot, uh, not a, enough large print, lack of budget, lack of space. They didn't have any space to, um, to grow their area. They need more variety, um, but they couldn't find it in large print. Um, but 70% did feel that they provide enough large print to their users, so that it, there is that. Um, barriers to purchasing items in large print. This has not really changed since the beginning. When I read in the library journal uh, way back at the beginning in the 60s and 70s, same thing, it hasn't changed. Um, you know, books just aren't uh, provided in large print, not enough money, not available from the vendor, out of print. So large print, you know, it's only printed once, definitely. So that is an issue of when a large print book goes out of print, um, but 60% reported that they have no trouble buying in large print. Um, other considerations, um, just where your location is uh, for your collection physically, providing seating, having no books on the top shelf or bottom shelf um, so that they're as accessible. Um, uh, let's see, I'm just reading through here. Good lighting kept coming up in the comments, which I did not realize and, and like I said, the last couple of years, boy, I need more light to see things. And I'll just tell you that. And I am not too old yet, but I can already tell that lighting is a lot more important than I realized. It's definitely since I worked in the library. Um, promoting their library. Less than half said they promote their large print collection. Uh, those that do use displays, uh, staff recommendations, um, a lot of people have outreach. They put it in newsletters and flyers, social media, things like that. Um, State Library, and here's where I wanted, I wanted to stop soon because I wanted Laura to have a moment here, but um, uh, some state libraries have large print collections and other collections that are available to libraries, not just users. But in this survey, we found that 53% of librarians across the nation did not know what services the state library had. And I thought that was really important that half, over half did not know, and that is super important. So I encourage you to find out what your state library has available. Um, when I worked in the library, we had just little signs that said library for the blind, here, go there. Um, but I didn't even know anything about it. Um, in Tennessee now we have a large, large print collection that can rotate amongst libraries. So libraries can borrow it to give users more um, books to use. Um, so wrap up. So uh, location, it's really important that people can get to your large print collection that it's not hard to get to for patrons with mobility issues, that it's near good lighting. Um, some of these we've said near help kept coming up so people could ask for help, that it's not like way in some corner away from any, um, you know, librarian staff member that can help. Rotate the collection, collection if possible. We frequently don't assume you know what they want and partner with your state library. Um, closing thoughts. Realize the value of all formats. Don't be like me where I was a little judgmental, not out loud, hopefully, um, that one was better than the other. Um, I just didn't know what I didn't know, right? Uh, don't pigeonhole users in regard to preference about what they want to read. Don't create self-fulfilling prophecies about usage and have multiple books in multiple formats, if at all possible, and partner with your state library. Um, I think I brought up a lot of these uh, challenges before. And thank you. So I will... I will stop sharing now. Um, I do have references at the end. And like I said, Courtney um, has that information. So I did wanna give Laura a chance if she's here real quick to, um, to say something about uh, the State Library at, in Indiana and what they have. Laura, are you here? 
I'll hop in real quick. Um, Abby from our uh, Talking Books and Braille Library also hopped in up here at the top of our chat. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, she works with uh, Bard. And she said, if you have any questions to contact her, she did put her contact information there in the chat box. So um, I will also include that when I send out the recording. Um, so if you have any questions about BARD or services for the blind and print disabled, you can go ahead and email Abby. Um, we do have a couple of questions, but before we move on to those, um, I won't put uh, Laura on the spot, but what I will do is put our talking book and braille library um, website in the chat there. So you can take a look and see, uh, but there's a lot of um, uh, things that we have here at the State Library. Um, and Abby, if you wanna hop in and talk, you're more than welcome to as well. It looks like Lisa let you do that, but if you don't want to, that's fine as well. Oh, she doesn't have a mic, that's fine. Um, so there are a few ways you can utilize services from Talking Books. Um, they offer large print deposit collections, which is a group of about 50 books that you can um, take for your public library and loan for three months. Um, and you can take those out to the patrons. Um, and then after a few months, you can return the books for a fresh supply. I think that's something that we don't always talk about um, that we offer here at the library. So I think that's a really good thing to say. And it looks like Laura has a mic. So I'm gonna go ahead. Hi, can everyone hear me? Okay, good. Yes. Um, yeah, so we, two things. Yeah, we do offer the rotating deposit collections for any library in Indiana. Um, you just uh, contact us and we'll figure out like a system. Um, we usually allow like about a maximum of 22, uh, I'm sorry, not 20 to 30, 80 to 90 um, large print books at a time for like, three months ish we don't we're not very strict about um, uh, uh, return times um, so we've got yeah several libraries and the list is growing that do that um, and any individual can also request books through ill if they're in if they're part of the evergreen consortium um, they can uh, request through evergreen but anyone can request just through regular ill We have a question in here and maybe Laura, you're the person to answer this one. Um, does the patron sign up for the talkie books? Yes, um, you, if, if it's a patron, yeah, you just, you would go to our website um, and fill out the application. I'm, I'm gonna, I don't know if it gives a uh, large print as an option right now, um, but I'm gonna get our individualized uh, one up there soon, uh, like within a day or two. And that'll have an option for large print on there as well as you know the audio and the braille. Wonderful, thank you. Um, there have been a lot of, um, not a lot of questions, but a lot of just chatting going on. And it's it's been, um, uh, it looks like a lot of people are saying large print requests are increasing, uh, but, but someone also said that older patrons are ask, actually asking for regular print because those large print books are pretty heavy and they're hard to hold. Um, we did have a question. Let me go back up. Does anyone have resources for making PDFs more accessible? I have patrons wanting larger than large print font as well as highlighting and notation features on a Kindle Fire. Do you know anything about that, Holly? Um, I don't specifically know. Um, I do know, you know, that some libraries have those magnification systems um, that people could use a book with. Um, or, and some people just have magnified, I've seen, you know, some people just go old school and magnifying glass, but no, I don't know too much about if you need larger than Kindle has, but I would assume that that is something where that patron might need to um, also be in a touch with the state library as a patron themselves of those services, because I think at that point, you're probably getting to where you really have some severe vision problems. 
Uh, someone says, I can't wait to share your work with my collection development staff. Um, and then someone asked, can you go back to the vendor slide for purchasing large print, please? Uh, can... Yes, let me try to do that real quick. Um, and then I'll also be sending her um, slides to you as well. Um, yeah, so I'm most, I think, yeah, here it is. So Gail Sanjay Thorndike, you know, has different imprints, but they're all kind of the same one company. So you can, you know, order from Thorndike specifically or Cengage specifically, but they, there's different prints coming out. And since large print is having kind of a heyday at the moment, um, there's just a lot of different options, center point. And of course, if you have Baker and Taylor or Ingram, you can order through them. Um, Amazon, I guess you can buy them, but I'm, I'm always kind of, you know, I'm a kind of a use a vendor just because of services kind of person, but I understand about money issues. And it looks like Sarah in the chat did have an answer for that PDF question um, and some links that she has. She did put her email address in there if you have any questions about that. And um, let's see, patron signs up so they can get them directly delivered to them. I'm not sure what that's referring to. Maybe the, um, the talking books. And if that's the case, Yes. Um, Rebecca has a question maybe for the group. We have limited space for our large print collection. Um, does anyone shel shelve large print with their regular print books or do you keep them separate pros and cons? So if you have any information about that, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. And okay, Abby says that um, they offer individual patron accounts and institutional accounts as well, where a library can check out books from our Talking Books at Braille Library. Okay, Holly has her contact information in the chat if you have anything um, to follow up with her with. Laura says you can sign up the nursing home itself with Talking Books and Braille Library. Just put yourself as the chat. Um, are large prints available to check out through the Indiana Talking Books? I'll let Laura pop in for that. Oh, she did say it in the chat. Yes, they have a large collection. I should keep reading. Okay, here's a great question. What happens if a talking book is misplaced and how do fines work? If someone could talk about that. Oh, right there in the chat, talking books that are checked out by talking book patrons aren't subject to fines. Okay, anybody have any other questions? Let's go ahead and put those in the chat box. What I'm gonna do if you need an LEU for this presentation, um, I am gonna put a link in the chat. You'll need to fill out that form and I'll get those LEUs out to you um, probably this week. Um, if you're watching an archived recording of this presentation, information about how to get those LEUs um, are on the video's description in YouTube. Or you can also find those instructions on the ISL's continuing education site under LEU policies. So thank you so much, Holly, for sharing this information with us. And I, I will be sending out um, Holly's presentation slides, the recording, her resources, and also um, Abby's contact information. Um, she's our talking book um, person who deals with the Bard Library, and she can help you with all of that information. Lisa, we can go ahead and stop the recording.